one for exceedance is about the water that can't get into the drainage system. So it's about looking at the water that's kept on the surface and the flows, where the flows are rooted and where those are rooted to and trying to manage them as safely as possible. It's about reducing risk for flooding. As far as I'm concerned, designing for exceedance um, is kind of a backup, um, if you like, um, when capacity is ex exceeded um, on streams um, or drainage systems and water is no longer um, flowing within the areas that it should do. But I think it's also something slightly more than that in that it, sometimes it can actually be a cost-effective solution um, to help protect a community or even a small number of houses from flood water. Designing for exceedance for me is that we um, manage uh, water, that, uh, storm water that comes out from, from, from drainage uh, on the surface. Uh, it could come out from drainage even when, uh, uh, because inlets are blocked. But when that water's on, on the surface, we, we then to choose to manage it rather than let the exceedance manage us and the impact that that, that actually causes. Design for exceedance really is, is our answer to, to SOD's law that when we design anything, when we design a, a drainage system in this case, at some point something will go wrong. It's bound to. Either something will go wrong with the system or we'll have a heavier storm than we expected or a long string of, of storms that we weren't expecting. And design for exceedance is just thinking about what's going to happen in those circumstances and making sure that it doesn't go catastrophically wrong, that we know what's going to happen and that it's not going to cause people damage or disruption. It's good practice in that for a very relatively small amount of investment we can make our drainage systems far more resilient to flooding now and in the future. Well I think the exciting thing to me about designing for exceedance is that the problem starts to become considered spatially at the landscape scale and as a landscape architect plainly that matters to me. Designing for exceedance helps us to reduce flood risk um, so it's about taking one of the unknown elements almost of flood risk you know that water that can't get into the drainage system when our either traditional pipe systems or our subsystems become overwhelmed and looking at that water and seeing where we can route it, where it can be conveyed over the surface in the safest way and where we can actually store that water. Um, by doing so, we can actually improve safety. We can reduce the threat to life, we can reduce um, damage to properties, damage to infrastructure and also ensure safe ingress and egress routes when there is a flooding event. Um, I think if you look at urban creep and development, it's actually putting increased pressure on an already overwhelmed drainage system. So we need to increasingly look at how we can manage the water that won't get into that drainage system. We're experiencing more and more extreme, intense events. So it's becoming increasingly important that we do this. Well, I think design of exceedance is, is good practice from, it helps us join up the continuum of rainfall events. So whereas before we've always kind of designed for everyday rainfall and rainfall to maybe try and stop flooding, we've then had this gap to where we have uh, extreme rainfall and we rely on emergency planning and civil contingencies. Design of exceedance, I think, actually comes into this gap in the middle. And that's where it allows us to then actually manage the water on the surface deliberately. And so I think it's, 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 it's good practice because it provides practical ways for us to address this gap, both technically but also in terms of working with disciplines, organisations and communities to actually close that, that gap. It's good practice because we should always be thinking about the consequences of what we've considered and what we haven't considered. And um, it's good practice because we don't know what's going to happen, what the future is going to hold. And we don't, if we don't think about design for exceedance, then we're potentially leaving open a, a gaping hole of, of consequence for the community that we, that we haven't even thought about. So thinking about designing for exceedance is, is an essential, really. Um, what we then do about it depends on what it's going to cost and what benefit it's going to bring. But you've got to at least think about it as, uh, for every project. 
Before I started the project, I thought it was just about um, those involved in drainage design. But what I've realised from looking at the case studies is that it's a whole range of different people. So, um, number one, communities need to be involved because there's the one they are the people that live and work around um, um, flooding. And it's anyone that's involved in um, managing and creating open space. So that could be parks and gardens, highway authorities, architects, landscape architects. And I'd also say those that uh, are involved in new development. So that might be developers, house builders, and of course local authorities that are making decisions on new development. I think there's a number of people or organisations who need to be involved with designing for exceedance. Firstly, there's a myriad of disciplines, both in terms of the retrofit situation and in terms of new development. So retrofit might, for, for example, be a drainage engineer and a highway engineer working together to manage exceedance on the road manage risks that actually may come from that and how to mitigate those, those, those risks. So for example, being able to provide a way to drain the road, to, to actually drain the exceedance once uh, that actually stops and to actually stop water ponding for long periods of time. So we can drain away and then we're not worried about the risk of ice forming. In new development, we may see far more disciplines working together. And I think this is quite critical where architects who may actually lead that that role, really understand what exceedance is, why it's important to manage, and why it's important to think about that right from the outset. But then you have all the other disciplines coming together. It could be urban design, it could be landscape architects, it could be highway engineers. And bringing all those pe people together to be able to actually manage exceedance. And if we all understand where each other's coming from, then we can assess the risks and mitigate them appropriately. I think we've then got organisations. Organisations working together will enable us to put solutions in, and I think particularly in the retrofit scenario, that's so important for us, for us to do. Because it might be flooding from a water company asset, but it then falls on the local lead, uh, the lead local flood authority to then actually try and actually manage that exceedance. Uh, so working together, to really understand maybe sharing data becomes so much more critical. I think finally, uh, but maybe most importantly, it's how communities can become involved. Communities play a really critical role in terms of understanding what's go going on, what the problem is, but then becoming involved in helping shape and accept the solution. And so, but we, we may need to actually different ways to involve communities. In more rural or close-knit communities, we may find it's actually far easier to get them involved. In, in big urban development areas, it, that might be far harder. So we need to look at how we get pe pe people involved and wanting to actually play their part, because they can be quite active. They're the ones who are often on the ground at the time when exceedance occurs. So they, can, they, they really can play their, their part in agreeing to procedures to actually maybe help close roads or provide local protection to actually prop properties.